Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the World Health Organization Center for Aging and Life Course and the International Federation on Aging, I'd like to welcome you to the seventh in a series of webinars on age-friendly environments. Today's webinar is called Social Inclusion and the Design of Age-Friendly Spaces and will be presented by Dr. Ryan Woolrich. Dr. Woolrich is an associate professor in urban studies at Harriet Watt University and an adjunct professor at the Gerontology Research Center, Simon Fraser University, Canada. He has significant expertise of working on funded research in, pardon me, in the UK and internationally exploring the experiences of home and housing in old age, evaluating the impact of communities services for older adults, and in applying visual and participatory methodologies to understanding the relationship between older adults and place. Dr. Wovich has published widely in housing and community journals. He is project lead on a three-year economic and social research grant entitled Placemaking with Older Adults Towards Age-Friendly Communities and co-investigator on two funded international research projects, bringing together local government community groups, residents, and practitioners in processes of collaborative planning and social change around healthy and active aging. On behalf of the IFA, I would like to thank Dr. Woolrich for presenting today. The IFA invites all participants to participate in, a, uh, in uh, questions after the presentation. Um, we'd like to invite you to do that via the questions tab. If you have any questions, please feel free to message me. Um, I am the organizer and I invite you to send your questions via email if they're not answered during the webinar. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Woolrich, so thank you all for attending. Thank you, um, Jessica, for the, for the introduction. And I would just like to start off by saying thank you um, for the opportunity today to come and present uh, some of my research and um, talk about some of the things that we've been doing um, internationally in, in this area. Jessica, should I just move that off the screen? Uh, sorry? Can, um, can yeah, you see if, my I can see, can see sort my presentation? Of the, uh, yeah, if you do from current slide, it should get big and then you should be good. Okay. You can see that okay? Yes. Perfect. So today, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about social um, inclusion and exclusion and its impact within the context of urbanization and aging. Um, people tend to ask me why I focus on urban areas and what I mean by urban. Um, I mean anything non-rural. Um, in the urban context, this includes cities, um, but also suburban uh, neighborhoods. Um, and it's not to say that rural areas are not important places to focus on in respect of aging and they bring all their unique challenges um, and some of the findings I think do translate across to to rural communities um, but my uh, research focus has been on urban areas and cities and urban urban neighborhoods um, and today I'd like to discuss some of the opportunities and challenges in respect of um, social inclusion and urban areas and at the end, maybe have the opportunity to pick up on some of these issues and, and maybe other people's um, experiences as well. Um, I understand that the policy context in the UK will be very different to other jurisdictions. Um, I'm not presenting much about policy today, um, but to say that social exclusion and inclusion is right back on the agenda um, in the UK, um, stimulated in part by an Age UK um, ILC report asking the question about if social inclusion um, was still important for older people today. Um, and the concept, in part, that was a response to the fact that the concepts have virtually disappeared from national policy in the UK, being associated with previous uh, Labour governments and the disbanding of a social exclusion unit in the UK. So um, although it's very much still on the agenda in European and UN policy, and it's starting now to gain more traction in the UK context, largely on the back of studies such as the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, which have identified that older adults, um, particularly those who are frail um, and experiencing cognitive decline, 
and also particularly those living in deprived communities are more likely to experience uh, multiple forms of, of social exclusion. Um, and keeping older people, you know, everybody, you know, knows um, independent and autonomous, um, you know, can be regarded in two ways, you know, partly that it's a societal obligation, you know, a moral and human rights perspective. Um, to make sure people and certain groups are not excluded from um, social relationships and civic activities and access to inf information and cultural activities. Um, and similarly, prolonged independence in old age can also have um, fiscal and financial benefits. So it can be argued from an economic perspective about the fact that, you know, if people are socially included um, and they are active and they can stay healthier for longer, um, you know, this does have um, health and social care benefits. Um, so it's a debate that's currently happening quite strongly now in the context of the UK, um, particularly in terms of um, funding uh, the National um, Health Service. Some of the findings that I, I will present back um, as part of this presentation are ones that have been emerging from, a, um, as Jessica mentioned, a, a grant that I am currently uh, lead on. It's a cross-national um, proposal. It's funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK, and it's very much um, focused on understanding how older people experience aging across different urban social and cultural contexts. So we're working, and it's a collaboration with Brazil um, around how we can, um, what we can understand about older adults' experiences across across different contexts, and also what the implications of that are for the design of age-friendly cities and communities. And if you want to find out more later on, there's, there's a website and um, a Twitter handle as well if you, if you um, are interested in finding out more. I think it's important to say that population aging and urbanization, you, you know, having different ways become quite dominant uh, social trends and they've raised issues for all types of communities. Um, and in some ways and in some countries, this has occurred against the backdrop of rapid urban change the rise of the smart city movement, mega cities, uh, uh, and um, and other large, um, highly dense and heterogeneous cities in, in some cases. However, it's important to note that in other parts of the world, cities have also undergone significant depopulation. Uh, this has happened particularly in a uh, UK context, for example, brought on by deindustrialization uh, and significant underinvestment in our cities, which have hollowed out the urban core um, and I think it's um, and one thing that I don't think has been particularly recognised, partly because we don't have the case to the evidence for it, is how experiences of ageing are likely to differ significantly across those um, urban contexts. And to some people, you know, urban living can bring significant opportunities, um, close proximity to transport, services, amenities, employment opportunities and, and cultural support, which can all form um, parts of social inclusion. But also urban living can bring many threats um, in terms of access to, to, to good housing, um, lack of basic services, um, spatial and inequality and social polarization. Uh, and these things can actually reinforce social exclusion. So there's these type of processes and opportunities and threats that urban areas, um, that urban areas can have. Um, why older people? I, I think older adults particularly are likely to be impacted by sudden changes to the immediate environment. So in old age, particularly with cognitive decline and frailty, they're more likely to focus on that immediate proximity around home. Um, and so any changes to that can um, ultimately impact them um, as much, if not more, than other groups. Um, secondly, I think there's, a, there's an urban uh, movement which has been focused on how we can design cities with economic factors and urban areas with economic factors in mind, um, predicated largely on you know, how much money we can bring into a city. Um, rather than creating a city as a dwelling space, i.e. a city that people want to spend time in. And I know a number of studies which have, uh, have looked at old age in the context of urban environments. have found that often older adults feel disconnected, um, alienated from the city um, and excluded from urban areas. Um, and we've seen that within the context of the research that we're doing, um, which is that often older adults who are living in a high rise tenement block in the center of Glasgow, for example, with no lift, and no social supports can be excluded um, as anybody else. And um, so I think there are disproportionate impacts as well in terms of our inequalities, which again are poorly understood, you know, in terms of how older people, for example, living in slums and shanty towns. Um, so cities should be seen 
obviously is an aesthetic and technical challenge in terms of how we design these age-friendly supports, but also in uh, you know socially how cities can reinforce inequalities, exclusion, and marginalisation, and, and likewise how that can impact on um, impact on older adults. Um, and why this is particularly relevant in the context of our work in Brazil is that people, uh, communities, a, uh, societies are aging at different rates. Um, and some of the discussions we've been having uh, in Brazil um, are about the rapidly aging population um, over there, considering that Western Europe, certainly the UK, has had a number of years to respond to an aging population. But that's likely to happen faster in, in countries such as Brazil. And, and do we need new theories or models of aging that will respond to, um, to, to some of these issues? And about priority needs and some of our lower income communities in Brazil. Uh, the research that we've been doing, uh, you, you know, has often commented on the, the, the difficulties in accessing just basic necessities, uh, clean water, um, utilities, um, and basic services. And so the discussion has, has been slightly different in that um, context. And also, you know, we recognise very early on in the research that we were doing that Western solutions are not necessarily um, going to fit the social, political, and also the cultural structure in, in some of these countries. Um, and so do places, um, you know, what do these models look like and do places need to respond to um, these different um, forms of um, urban change and, and political buy-in as well. Um, social exclusion, uh, you know, sometimes I see this as sort of the opposite of, you know, social inclusion um, in terms of what social exclusion uh, brings. And I know some of the very early definitions of social exclusion um, focused on the importance and centrality of, of income. Um, and I know income is extremely important and I wouldn't want to sort of um, undermine the importance of income um, because without you know, inability to pay household bills and difficulties in, in, in social participation and leisure opportunities and money does constrain those forms of engagement. Um, but um, also, I think this and this definition recognizes that actually, um, you know, it's also about these different sort of multiple forms of um, of disadvantage, and it's as much about the relational stuff uh, in terms of social participation and lack of social integration, and also issues of, of power. Um, and central to this is, you know, I think that this debate is how we create opportunities for social participation uh, for older adults such that they do feel. Uh, socially included um, and this isn't only having the opportunities to be engaged um, but it's having the resources to take advantage of, of, of these opportunities um, you know so I don't think it's any good having leisure opportunities for example if there are no means for connecting older people to them uh, similarly opportunities to participate um, and make a positive contribution they're integral to notions of, of, of freedom and autonomy um, and I suppose there are a few issues with a definition of, of social exclusion. Um, for, first and foremost, it, it tends to frame everything as quite negatively, you know, forms of social exclusion. Should we be framing it more positively in talking about social connections, uh, community cohesion and, and building a, a more just society as part of a social uh, inclusion, inclusive framework? Um, and maybe we need to closely consider the importance of, of diversity in this issue. Uh, for example, the role of age, gender, um, ethnicity, which hasn't quite um, quite been articulated in the in the um, age friendly communities agenda. This is also driven by the notion, and a key policy driver in many countries, is about how we support aging in place. Aging in place, assuming that the home and the community is the preferred environment within which people want to age. It's generally where people feel comfortable making decisions. They feel a strong sense of independence. Equally, the home can have some symbolic, emotional, psychological value to, to, to the older adult. However, you know, we've noticed this in, in the research that we're doing is that often um, the home can quite quickly become a very vulnerable, social isolating environment without those supports being in place. So often you find that these sort of notions of home change across the life course and particularly in old age when there are difficulties with um, activities of daily living that, that can be brought about. And so Gallant, um, Stephen Gallant, talked about in some of this literature about aging in the right place. 
you know that it's about actually not just aging in place but aging in a place where people do have access to assets and resources um and are living in a community of choice and this is very much about seeing older adults as a, as a resource and um particularly um in the uk but also in terms of some of the academic literature it's tended to look at um old age um as as a sign of weakness uh, deterioration and that's not been particularly helpful um to um certainly even speaking to older adults at a community level about them variously being seen or feel they are a burden um a drain on on the pension system which is common in the uk where we see very negative headlines um and where older adults are blamed um often for the demise of of health and social care services um and often being an excessive burden and again within the context of the uk these discussions are had with um the, the the national health service and how we continue to fund the national health service and this is filtered down to intergenerational tension at, at a local level as well um and more recent politically as well with the with the brexit vote um where the uh, blame seemed to lie squarely with with all the voters um and so there's this very damaging sort of um rhetoric around older old age and what it means and being seen as um being seen as a burden as opposed to seeing it as an opportunity um and, and either way we look at this i think we you know we're talking about two sides of the same coin you know an, an, an environment that is conducive you know to active aging um will have benefits in terms of health um which will in turn um you know um reduce health and social care costs so i i think it's you know whilst the the headlines and the media have been quite um negative around this notion of the aging population i think if we see it as an opportunity it essentially addresses that 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 debate anyway um i think what's quite um alarming from data in the uk um has been this disparity between uh, life expectancy and uh, and healthy life expectancy so whilst life expectancies continue to increase so slowed down slightly recently in the uk um healthy life expectancy um has not closed the gap um so what we're finding now for example in the uk um is that the life expectancy uh, for males is around 80 and for females is around 83 um but the life expected the healthy life expectancy i.e the number of years that somebody can live in in supposedly self-assessed good health um is, is still a significant gap so um you know for females it's around um it's around 60 uh, for males it's around 16 years and for females um that gap is around uh, 19 years so there's a significant period of time there where people are not self-assessing their um, health is particularly good and the role of the environment that they can play in encouraging that form of um form of active aging um these are some of the things that have, uh, have come up and some of the questions also that have been raised around um how we can enable social inclusion with older adults and the type of things that we need to look at you know and, uh, and partly it is about addressing these issues of autonomy and choice uh, and freedom as, as key markers of of social exclusion um, and it's how we can provide a range of physical social and cultural supports for older adults to to age in the community and to age well um, with a high quality of life um, how we can challenge some of this discrimination and stigmatization that, that often excludes older people and th i think there are possible ways of, ways of doing that and to enable opportunities for older adults to assume meaningful roles in the community um, uh, and, you know, part of this comes down to sort of equitability, um, you know, in respect of making sure that, you know, older adults have access to services. There have been a number of different frameworks and, uh, and measures of how we go about designing um, age friendly communities. And a large number of these have had social inclusion as a central component of them. So the social inclusion, uh, the notion of social inclusion is is weaved into some of these. Sometimes it's given um it's sort of given sort of secondhand status and in other ways are central to to how we might measure an age-friendly community some of you will be familiar with these uh the inclusive design for getting outdoors guidance um it's more specific guidance um um designed um in the uk focused on on accessibility and other indicators the place standard is currently being used in a in a Scotland context about how we can design viable places, not just to age, um, focus more on inclusive environments. And um, the, the wheel in the bottom right hand corner is um, part of this place standard, which also has evaluation mechanisms built into them for how we can, how we can measure um, age friendliness. 
and these are some of the uh, dimensions which again most of you will be familiar of in in respect of the World Health Organization age friendly age friendly city um, domains and they make sense in terms of the different dimensions to us I, I think sometimes the notion of social inclusion is being tagged on to issues of uh, respect rather than being given first um, order priority um, so that's tended to be about how we respect older adults rather than you know the deep aspects of um, multiple forms of social exclusion however you might also argue that social inclusion covers all those various different dim domains and um, that actually it's about having opportunities for social participation civic engagement um, good uh, quality housing and housing in the community um, and transportation and, and other forms of information and communication the I think one of the slight weaknesses and what led us to some of this, um, some of the research that we're doing is that it's tended to generic, the, to create these generic guidelines, these um, more sort of one size fits all um, approaches to how we might go and audit our communities and our cities to check that they are age friendly. And whilst a number of these recommendations make perfect sense um, and we should, we should be seen to be doing them, um, they tend to assume that these guidelines are necessarily going to fit across different cultural and social and urban urban contexts rather than understanding that actually aging might differ significantly across communities and urban areas of of different size so this is tended to assume more of a homogeneity of old age that if we do address these does this necessarily make our community age friendly well perhaps but in other areas certainly we, we've noticed that certain groups for example are maybe not represented very very well in these checklists and we often aging you know as a subjective um, experience of, often isn't captured very well in in, in checklist and, uh, and guidelines for an age friendly an age friendly community I'm going to just talk through some of the themes now that are, are, have come out of the research that we've been doing in terms of um, age friendly um, spaces and uh, and social social exclusion and social inclusion and some of these themes are themes from the um, data that we've been uh, collecting with the community so what we've done with the research that, that, that we're doing and we're working in three UK cities Glasgow Edinburgh and Manchester and three cities in Brazil uh, Pelotas Belo Horizonte and uh, Brasilia and we're comparing some of the experiences across these different cities and within these cities we've we've selected um, three neighborhoods as well so in, in essence we've got a total of six cities and 18 neighborhoods that we're working in and we've been doing a lot of um, different types of methods with older adults some of those have been visual and creative photo diaries with with older adults um, alongside things like walking interviews with, with all the people in the communities that they're in and also some traditional qualitative and quantitative methods surveys and uh, and other things and so we've tried to get an understanding of um, what some of these issues have been um, from the perspective of older adults and some of the images I show reflect the images that older adults have taken themselves in in the community. One thing that you know was central to a lot of older adults' um, experiences was was the need to sort out and manage our outdoor spaces a lot better. So what we find found is that you know it's immaterial how age friendly a community is in respect of what services are available at the end of the road, for example, if the older adult cannot navigate from home. The 30 or 40 meters to to, to to the main high street if the that was often a sticking point for a number of older adults so they would find that they that they didn't go out because there were a number of barriers to, to actually doing that um, they talked about the presence of um, lack of resting points uh, street furniture um, to rest when undertaking a journey the presence of potholes and street maintenance you know is, is being common um, a frames and sandwich boards that have been left in the center of high streets and that just create barriers and also this issue of temporary disruptions uh, in terms of roadworks which often go on for a considerable amount of time and can significantly disrupt people moving around the community and again more acutely impacts those with with mobility uh, difficulties some people um, social participation social inclusion was highly seasonal and um, so I, I think we talked about sort of social inclusion but probably useful to think of it as a you know in a more dynamic way so people would often pass through forms of, uh, of times where they felt they were felt particularly socially excluded um, and often this would be seasonal with some of the older adults that we spoke to so some just didn't go out in the winter um, the lack of and the d difficulties around sort of fall hazards and ice and um, 
collecting yeah, leaves and uh, and issues around there, which would be fall hazards, which which prevented people um, going out. And some had actually had a fall, which then led to a, a sense of anxiety when leaving the home. Um, and some of the um, images that were presented by older adults in the communities, and, and this is in two of our uh, lower income neighborhoods. So we sampled our neighborhoods in the UK by, by income. That was one of the one of the um, one of the key indicators uh, to see if this issue of social inclusion and social participation differed um, significantly um, by income. And we found that in some of our lower income communities, there's been a significant eroding of the local community over time. Um, you won't be familiar with most of you won't be familiar with the term an overspill estate. They tended to be housing developments established between the 1950s and, uh, and 1960s in the UK. Um, they were meant to be overspill estates, as in quite as in connected to the city. But a lot of these are often at a certain distance away from the city, and the purpose-built housing estates. Um, and the, the the intention was to build what you can see in the images, which are shopping parades, into the um, into the developments as focal points for the community. Over time, in these lower income neighborhoods, these parades and these um, focal points have eroded, and they've received a significant lack of um, of investment. Um, and so, for some, this notion of social inclusion was bound up within a reflection of neighborhood change and economic decline. Uh, so a number of older adults had to now travel longer distances. A lot of uh, services have been centralized um, and didn't have those immediate neighborhood supports um, and often had to rely then on other people to take them around their communities. So that was very much about the sort of broader processes, I think, of, of neighborhood change and economic decline and how they have impacted on uh, local communities and points towards the need for further urban regeneration in these communities that that bring and better understand how, how older adults uh, move around their local areas. These were some of the things captured by older adults with it when walking around their communities. So in the top left hand corner, we, we you know we have particular issues around sort of parking and insensitivities in respect to parking. And whilst you know the more mobile amongst us might enable us to sort of walk around this uh, hazard in the top left hand corner, this. Um, van that's been parked on, on the sidewalk. For those with um, walkers, those with wheelchairs, they found these kind of things could be a real detriment uh, detriment to getting out of, uh, into the community. Similarly, top right hand corner, the image of um, litter and litter in the communities and, and often this being about place aesthetics and, and pride in the community and um, as well as being a disincentive um, to going out. And in the bottom left hand corner and significant council cuts and local government cuts in the UK, have led to the closure of local public toilets and washrooms um, and older adults expressing dissatisfaction with this in particular and the lack of um, options for them you know so a lot of stories about people feeling that oh we can go and use the uh, the toilet in the coffee shop but we feel um, like we have to buy something or we feel that often the toilet's locked and they have to go and ask for the key at, uh, at the front of the um, at the front of the shop, and this can create sort of barriers and feelings of if, uh, of dependence, which they were keen to move away from. And the bottom right hand corner is is um, a place space in Glasgow uh, that was designed, um, and again, you know, um, being particularly difficult for older adults to access. No, um, particularly in wheelchairs, getting down into this into this into this playground space. So it impacts on how older adults can be seen to be engaging in some of those intergenerational um type um types of social engagement at a community level because the urban in, urban environment often acts as a as a form of um as a form of architectural uh, disability to some not getting out of the house um was um enabled them to turn upon their communities in, in some way so a community that was very valuable uh, in terms of aging in place suddenly becomes a very vulnerable and isolating environment when mobility difficulties in old age make it difficult to access access that environment and people feeling a strong sense of social injustice and frustration with not being able to access the community um, COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and is a, a condition that, um, that, that, that traps the airwaves which, which prevents many people from getting out of the house but these conditions in old age have, have prevented these chronic conditions have often prevented people from engaging in forms of social inclusion visiting friends and uh, and other things within within the local uh, community
transportation came up as a significant barrier to social inclusion. Um, so not being able to get out of um, being able to get out of the house, but not being able to get to a service um, or a particularly uh, a particular amenity. Um, loss of driving license. This is not new research. People have already identified the link between loss of driving license and the impact on on independence. Um, but to some people, the transport interventions that were there were were not suitable. Um, so often transport interventions were fine on the main arterial routes in and out of the city. Um, they tended not to support the journeys that older adults wanted to make, which was those across communities. So they typically, typically make shorter journeys, but they would do it across communities. And that wasn't particularly well provided for. So we had examples of older adults getting buses into the city centre to come back out to um, an area, a journey that would take, you know, walking would, you know, walking at a quick pace would only take 20 minutes, it was then taking longer because old adults had to come into the city to then come back out of the area. So there's this very much this thing about the lack of a whole journey approach um, to transport planning, that we can get to a certain point and then we, we hit a sticking point, um, which prevents us then from getting on, it can be a different mode of transport, it can be the difficulties in getting to your destination at the other end so the, the, these were common problems as were things like the absence of bus shelters in, in in the local community so we had these two pictures taken by um an older adult who this is our lower income community um our more what is seen as a more deprived community for want of a better word um and it's it's called bagley and it's in in the south of uh, manchester um and she chose to take these two images because on in the left hand image we we see that a stump um, in the ground there, which she used um, as a seating, uh, as, a, as an opposition, uh, as an opportunity to sit down whilst waiting for the bus. So there, there wasn't um, adequate seating. There wasn't a bus shelter on this side of the road. Um, and so she found when she was going to meet her friends in a in a community centre that she was waiting for the bus on this side. And often, um, you know, if the weather was particularly bad, which it which it often is in, in for those of you that know Manchester. Um, you, they, they, she found that she, you know, getting on the bus here, she was often by the time she got on, she, you know, she was um, she had to shelter from the elements. And interestingly, on the other side, there is a bus shelter, um, but it's on the return journey. So again, not particularly having a beneficial impact um, for this participant. Um, there were particular insensitivities shown by not only those using public transport, but those who were providing public transport. Um, and this is an incident now. Anybody. Um, over the age of, I think, 65 in the UK gets a gets a free bus pass. So this situation shouldn't emerge. You know, in essence, you know, older adults get free bus travel. So a situation like this should never um, should never have come about. But it turned out that um, a lady living with quite mild form of dementia in the community got confused um, uh, uh, when she was on a bus, did not know where she was going, and and assumed she had to pay even though she was in possession. Um, of a of a bus pass, and it particularly led to an unsavoury incident with with the bus driver, and and, and then since then, she, you know, she's not been on a bus. So that's how I think transport can act as a significant barrier to social inclusion. It only takes an incident like this that um, that, 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 that that leads to that. Uh, safety and security came up in um, a number of our communities. What was interesting about um, safety and security was that it was related to levels of deprivation and income. Um, but not in the way that we thought. So what was quite unsurprising, sorry, what was quite surprising about what we found out was that actually those in more deprived lower income communities had a heightened sense of safety and security than those living in the higher income communities. So often people in the um, higher income uh, communities would say they felt safe, often a perception of crime more than, um, more than actually being on the receiving end of actual crime. But they would say that we think, um, you know, that, that there's a um, by going out, we'll be on the receiving end of crime. Whereas in the lower income communities, because they, in some communities, they had this stronger sense of social cohesion. Uh, they knew people on the street, and this led to a sense of security and safety when using public uh, public spaces. So more likely to come out into into the community. It's quite unsurprising. Uh, it's quite surprising. Sorry, finding that. Um, housing and home um, again was strong, you know, in terms of in terms of um, social inclusion and exclusion. When we talked about housing and home with the number of older adults, um, to many, home was very important for housing social relationships. So, you know, having friends and family come round um, in the community, um, and that forms a sort of passive um, activities that people did in the home. So often, um, 
people would say, you know, I, I like reading, um, uh, you know, I like knitting. Um, you know, somebody's passive is, is their own work because people are engaged um, in these activities. But often that would be an assumption that they were isolated. So somebody would come, oh, you can't stay in your house, um, you know, day after day. It's important that you get out into the community. Well, some people actually did activities within the home, which are actually quite rewarding. Um, and we're wrongly interpreted in that case for many as social isolation. So they'd say, well, I'm not isolated. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very engaged in, in, in what I'm doing. It's just that I'm doing it within, within the home environment. The other key issue was that people wanted to age in the community and they wanted to age through different forms of housing support. So interestingly, people weren't against uh, different forms of housing. In fact, people could see benefits with sheltered forms of accommodation and, uh, and assisted living. Um, and they could be beneficial in terms of social inclusion. So some of the people we interviewed in sheltered supports had uh, the provision of communal spaces, um, which would bring people together, which would, could actually act as um, quite an important space for um, social networks to be developed. So it wasn't always the case that they didn't want these forms of housing supports. It was that they needed to be provided in the right way. And some models tended to reinforce a very institutional um, aspect of old age where people would be restricted uh, certain restrictions around who they can bring in and when um, and, and this sort of this attitude had, had then gone through to other people who said well you know I don't want to live in sheltered accommodation because of because of these um, issues that I've been uh, hearing about and housing options within communities were generally limited so some people uh, certainly in our higher income communities they lived in quite large properties with a lot of space um, and they saw the benefits of downsizing, but they didn't have any options to downsize to that would keep them in the community. So if you had to downsize, it tended to be into one bedroom um, accommodation and all that were saying, well, you know, we value our space. You know, we have um, I have my grandchildren coming over. Um, so that, you know, that was really important to, to, to a number of older adults. So it's about right sizing. It's about finding the right type of housing options for older adults and uh, something that um, We've not always um, not always got right within within our communities, um, and people wanted to be in a community of choice. That was quite a strong element of what they said, um, and co-located next to transport networks where possible, and and services and amenities. And again, I think the lesson there maybe for urban regeneration is how we can make sure uh, these forms of housing are, are, are deeply integrated into, for example, the regeneration of our town centres, which which can support that. Um, some people felt that there was difficulties in accessing services and um, they were often passed from pillar to post. There was a lack of continuity, uh, you know, people saying I have to tell my story more than once if I'm trying to access health and social care services. Some people just didn't know what they were entitled to. Um, and some people found there was, you know, there was often a lack of integrated joined up care between different sectors. Um, and sometimes the attitude of service providers themselves um, could be quite patronising at a very individual level. Um, this perception that older adults were in some way dependent um, on society and, and that often came through in the way that they were treated by service providers and to some it was just the lack of basic um, information uh, getting to them about what services were available uh, and that could be healthcare services you know equally it could be leisure services and other community uh, community amenities so people still relying on word of mouth within a lot of these communities, which, which was effective for some if you, if you were engaged. And um, again, you, you heard through word of mouth, that was fine. But if you were housebound, um, it wasn't as easy to find out about what's going on in your local um, area. There are a number of different opportunities in, in neighborhoods in, in respect of social participation. Um, so a lot of co communities were actually quite well um, provided for in terms of book clubs, dancing, gardening, but negotiating access for, to these services was often very difficult. So older adults said that sometimes it can be very cliquey um other times um you know they they don't know they don't know where to go um quite a few other people were actually put off by um visiting once and then not not finding it a particularly rewarding experience and and then being put off because they couldn't integrate into these uh into these settings um particularly well and there was quite a lot of negative perceptions a lot of people saying you know i'm I, i'm too old to do this or i don't feel i'm able to do this or um, and there's just been a lack of sort of translation um, a lot with older adults about the type of things that opportunities that might be available to them. Um, and some of these don't always have to be inclusive. In fact, some of the uh, more significant aspects um, of, of social engagement often happened in sort of you know, same sex groups, you know, so um, I think we've got an example on the next slide of a, of a woman's group in, um, in, in Easterhouse, again, our lower income community, but this time in Glasgow.
um, and this um, community and uh, and this community that had come together and, and we're all women and all came together and re-engaging with activities was particularly important so people said it, it gave me a chance to pick up skills that I thought I had lost um, as well as the social element you know as well as feeling a sense of group identity this was incredibly important to older adults you know so I go there and sometimes the activity is secondary um, and it's more about the social and it's more about, um, you know, as, as well as those learning opportunities, it's more about how a form of group identity um, is nourished around these forms of social engagement. I refer to civic participation as the forms of civic engagement that might be seen as, for example, community groups, council groups, um, and a number of older adults were, were very much involved in, in, these in these type of things. In fact, they often gave their time um, often voluntarily to to engage in these in these forms of um, engagement. However, they weren't always rewarding for a lot of older adults. So there's still this um, recurring message of older adults feeling as if that you know they're often um, you know they often go to these things, but they're not always um, that the, the, the comments are not always taken on board. So still very disingenuous, one-way forms of uh, community participation, and older adults feeling that their voice was more likely to be traded off. Um, in that in that consultation process, so yes, they do attend these community consultation events. No, that they're, they're not particularly well um, well responded to in terms of what happens. And a lot of older adults actually take on a huge amount of burden in old age for the community engagement stuff. And this can and did, with some older adults, lead to significant mental burnout. So people feeling as if they're taking on the problems of the community, um, a preoccupation that wasn't always beneficial. Uh, we didn't feel to, to older adults themselves. Um, and a quote there that nicely sums up, I think, about the fact that, you know, that they're often heard, but they're seldom listened to. That difference between, yes, you know, I do have my say, but no, nothing happens in, in terms of that. So, the, the, you know, the, the, the lack of active listening and two-way communication as part of that consultation and engagement process. Uh, volunteering and work, you know, this, this was seen as for formal and informal sort of formal stuff that tends to come through charity shops, but also the informal stuff in terms of people just going out and, cleaning up their street, we're cleaning up the community. So some of those are informal groups that very rarely get recorded um, and there's no particular reward for. Um, I'm mostly driven by altruistic means, so people saying it's my opportunity to put something back into the back into the community and, and do for others. Um, and people found that very, very rewarding. Um, people sometimes unsure how to volunteer and how to go about about doing that. Technology was a, was a central theme, Some, something I've looked at previously and um, Older adults, um, in the main, you know, this assumption that they w they wouldn't be using technology. In fact, a lot of people were, were using technology, and they were using it to feel better informed, finding out about stuff that's going on, finding out about health conditions. Not you know, that w sometimes wasn't always helpful, um, but also feeling um, socially connected as well. So people using Skype um, to maintain contacts and and WhatsApp as well, which was again quite surprising that older adults were using WhatsApp to communicate with friends who now lived at a distance so if older adults had moved out of the community and became more spatially disconnected technology had a real role to play in bringing those communities back together again and still feeling socially included you know despite um, maybe not having that face-to-face -face contact um, with, with people um, more instruction and support needed um, for, for, for older adults around around this process and courses needed to, um, to reach those that are housebound. So a lot of people that were housebound, um, they, they felt that they weren't getting those support. So those courses tended to be in, in libraries and other uh, in other communities. And um, just to finish off, I mean, th th there were some central things around what older adults wanted. I mean, first and foremost, they talked about not wanting to live in, in, in ghettos for the old. Now, that didn't mean not living in things like sheltered housing for older people. What it meant was that the community supports in and around that housing development needed to be intergenerational. And people didn't want to be depended on, you know, they wanted to have mutual forms of intergenerational exchange. Um, so I can do for somebody else because I've got these skills. If, you know, that younger person can come, for example, and, and do my garden or do my yard or clean my yard, whatever it might be. So very much about mutual exchange rather than seeing this as, oh, it's older adults uh, who always want the help. Um, so that was very important. Um, as was um, the intercultural supports. So in many of our communities, there was um, a percentage of ethnic minority groups and different types of ethnic minority groups. Often they didn't feel that their um, requirements were, were reflected particularly well in, in the age-friendly agenda. 
Um, so often those who are representing at community um, community consultation meetings and telling people what they want were not always reflecting the needs of different ethnic minority groups. Um, and often those needs and requirements were, were very different. Um, so I think that's something that broadly needs to be considered more in, in terms of social exclusion about how it can impact on ethnic minority groups, language and cultural barriers uh, amongst other things. Um, and lastly, yeah, we, we sort of bring in all this back, I think, in some of our research, it's, it's about rights to the city and about how we can ensure that older adults not only have the ability to um, access community-based supports, but that also they're involved in that broader participation about shaping the city and about shaping urban environments so that they're, um, they, they feel a stronger form of urban citizenship and, and governance. And some of that, I think, is about challenging existing practice. Uh, working with older adults um, a lot more um, and different groups um, to make sure age, gender and, and other things are, are strongly represented in that um, age friendly community agenda um, and how we better integrate that. You know, for example, there was an assumption that a lot of the interventions that are good for people over the age of 60 are, are good for everybody over the age of 55 or 60. And actually, there are very different groups within that age group and chronological indicators themselves are you know, particularly poor indicators of of, um, of of ability and functioning. So we have people at 55 who said, you know, I, I can't get out of the house, I'm housebound, I've got these physical limitations. Equally people that were 80 that were, were out and actively engaging in their community. So I think we need to recognize that old age has been more of a, you know, more of a fluid concept and, and socially constructed in, in many ways as well. These are just some of the methods that we used um, to engage with um, older adults in this um, in this process. and. Um, so try to put a lot of emphasis on co-dialogue uh, and, and collaboration with community groups and we're just at the stage now of the project of um, so the, in the top left hand corner um, is, is an area uh, just outside of Glasgow where we did some walking interviews with people with uh, dementia as part of a, as part of another project that we were involved in um, and in top right hand corner is some of the knowledge cafe sessions a certain methodology that brings uh, people together with uh, professionals as well around co-designing some of these spaces and in the bottom left and uh, um, right hand uh, bo bo bottom two images are some work that we did with an affordable housing complex with um, Chinese um, older adults and um, some of this centered around participatory mapping and how we can better map communities and design housing supports that support um, older adults um, and social inclusion I you know, and I think a lot of people sort of recognise this. You know, it's not going to be solved by one sector alone, but there's a lack of integrated work in it at a local level. So, actually, you know, people don't say, you know, I, it's just a transport problem for me. You know, that transport problem um, is often integrated with outdoor spaces and issues of um, health coming to it and provision of housing and also getting to some of these um, services and amenities. So it's not just about seeing these things in isolation and um, and about working across communities. And some are doing this quite well within their policy and their plans. Um, age-friendly Manchester, um, who were particularly seen as a uh, sort of benchmark poster child for the age-friendly city agenda, uh, has significant political buy-in and has also connected some of these uh, different sectoral and diff different levels of support. Um, so I think that basically summarises what I wanted to say. Uh, and I think in some ways, you know, how we can create these intergener intergenerational spaces, um, I, I think becomes integral to social inclusion. So in com some communities, this works particularly well. So um, we had an example of a community garden scheme um, that brought younger people and older people together um, and, and led to those forms of, of, of supports from, from, from coming about. And I think in some ways it's opening up um, spaces within our community. So um, I think people were sort of reticent about using uh, about what a community centre meant, for example. A lot of older adults felt it meant that it was a place for older people to go for the day rather than seeing it as an intergenerational space to bring different groups together. So younger people tended not to use um these centers as much as much as older adults understanding intersectionality so this is about age gender and um, it's also about sexuality and other things in old age that might actually lead to forms of um of, of social exclusion and how we can create models of age-friendly communities that reflect and inherently design flexibility within them so that you know it's not a one-size-fits-all approach it's about actually recognizing that there are different groups and, and different needs and priorities um in there and how we can make sure that we continue to engage the hardest to reach uh, older adults in these communities and forms of outreach and other forms of um, support. That, that brings me uh, to the end of the uh, presentation. So um, thank you for listening. I think I'll pass over to Jessica now for, for any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Woolrich, for your uh, fabulous presentation. Um, I think we have time for a few questions, so I'll just read from the ones that I've received and uh, invite others to send in their questions as well. Um, and just remind everyone that if we don't answer them, um, we try to keep them and answer them uh, at a later date, either through the age-friendly newsletter or through other means. So please feel free to send them. OK, the first question I have is, Changes cost money, and with already strained municipal budgets, how are communities paying for successful age-friendly programs and services? Yeah, um, there, um, how can they pay, and what can we do? I, th I think there's a couple of a couple of things there. There's, there's the things that um, actually are costing more money now. Um, so it's the things like, um, yeah, I mentioned that sort of older adults often are being passed from service to service. There's duplication of effort. They don't always work particularly efficiently. And we've not got these sectors working together, which I think will bring efficiency savings um, for a start. Some of the interventions that require money also have a counter argument to them. So the, the, the notion of potholes, for example, in pavements, um, that fixing that pothole is actually quite low cost. If we look at the potential for older adults to have a fall, require post fall care, hospital and social care admissions, etc. So. I don't think this is actually finding new money. I think in many cases, this is re almost reorientating its existing service provision and, and looking at the ways in which to be clever about some of these things. And again, it's, it's that preventative agenda. But the other thing that I think that local communities can do and, uh, and do very well is the opening of, up of sort of very low cost supports that, that will enable people to come together. You know, so often people, uh, the role of volunteering, for example, of people providing their own time. now. I, d I don't think we should always be relying on people to do stuff f f for nothing, but often they can bring these different groups together and often older adults, and it's happening within some of these communities, it's just not very well mapped, these older adults taking on the responsibility of of creating some of these social groups, which um, have been done with very little funding, and and it's amazing what can be done with very, very little money. Uh, and so others, it was just about the orientation of a bench in a park. You know, it was these very small scale uh, micro uh, micro scale things that you know I think um, need, need, need to be addressed so yes some of these things do do require money where does that come from reorientation of, of some of the services but also I think some of these are low cost and I don't think it necessarily always means more money um, but just about um, doing things slightly differently Thank you, Dr. Woolrich. Um, I think that leads nicely into the next question that we have, which is, are there examples of how seniors can take a leadership role in helping to implement age-friendly communities? Yeah, there, there, there are some, um, and, and I come back to the age-friendly Manchester um, guidance, and again, you know, that there is probably a lot going on in different, in different cities, but what was particularly uh, beneficial from an age-friendly Manchester perspective was the types of um, older adults. First of all, they set up a, a citizen's charter, which had um, a specific um, uh, detail around older adults' rights in, in, the, in the city and in the community. And they'd also set up a number of uh, consultation groups um, with older adults. So, for example, they've set up a number of cultural champions in, in, in Manchester, which have sought to engage different groups in, in forms in different forms of activities in the city um, and so older adults um, often want to assume these champion roles and often do within their communities um, so a lot of that stuff is going on particularly well in in, in Manchester and the people that we interviewed from that um, from that older adults um, working group that's been set up by the city um, was, um, was it was particularly rewarding what was happening so they would have monthly meetings with uh, local government about what the priorities were and then they very much felt that those priorities then were were, were taken up and acted upon, which often doesn't happen with, with these forms of things. So um, the cultural champions and the leadership uh, forms of leadership, and there are things on the Age Friendly City Manchester website about how we can um, about forms of engagement with older adults to take you know to assume so they can take a leadership role um, in, in some of this. Great. Um, okay, so the next question is, did anything come through in your research regarding ageist attitudes towards older adults or ageist policies? Ageist, age-friendly attitude, um, the, the issue, um, sort of ageism in the context of attitudes w w was quite strong. Um, and I think um, some of, there's been this intergenerational tension, and uh, I think what's happened in the UK is that that's often come down to um, to, to a community level. Uh, so people feeling um, invisible 
in public spaces, some would actually use the word invisible. I thought it was quite uh, quite relevant to how they felt. And um, when we explored this notion of visibility, they said, well, often, you know, people will walk past me. I don't feel recognized. Um, some people, as I say, would, um, particularly in the transport example of, of, of people who felt that there was a lack of sensitivity to the needs of older adults. Um, and so whilst it wasn't a direct form of discrimination in terms of ageism, um, you know, you, you could clearly see the subtle ways in which it was coming across um, at a local community, at a local community level. Um, and older adults just didn't want to be seen as in need of help. So, you know, people often resisted the fact that, um, you know, people would often help to, um, you know, take the shopping across the road, for example, which, you know, we might, we might, we might say, well, that's, you know, that's a real nice thing to, for people to be doing. And often older adults, you know, said, well, you know, I, I want to be seen as part of it, of the community. I want to be seen as an individual. I don't see myself as an older person. And um, so whilst it weren't direct forms of ageism, there was often these subtle ways, you know, the way that people were treated in their communities by, and by service providers where they were looked at with a certain level of pity um, or talked down to or talked to um, in a very sort of demeaning manner. And people resisted that and found that a form of um, sort of exclusion without it being a sort of, you know, some people might argue, and, you know, it's not a direct form of um, of ageism. It was coming through in those very, um, in those ways. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. So the last question is, um, where do you start the generation of age-friendly communities in developing countries like Mexico? Yeah, um, and this is where we are with um, a lot of this uh, stuff. So, you know, Brazil as a developing country, we, you know, we, we, we've got as a partner involved in the projects. And I've not presented any data from, um, from places like that. Um, I don't know about Mexico. I would be interested to hear how what the policy framework is currently in Mexico. If it's the same as other developing countries, and we've done some work in Colombia, um, there tends to be the lack of political buy-in for a start. Um, so people just don't see it as a priority. Um, there tends to be the lack of policy. So there isn't a policy framework um, often when you go looking for these things. Um, and so they're a very different trajectory to where we are in, in in the developed world, for example. And often the requirements are very different. So in parts of our lower income communities in Brazil, um, they didn't have a sidewalk. They didn't have a sidewalk at all in some of these communities. And we, we you know, we were talking about potholes in the UK and they're saying, well, hang on, you know, we, we, we're just, um, you know, we haven't even got a pavement, never mind uh, potholes in the pavement. Um, and, and they don't have access to basic services. So I think this sort of debate needs to happen in, in developing countries. The age-friendly city stuff, I don't think has had nowhere near enough attention in the developing world. And therefore, we don't really know. Firstly, well, we have some evidence of how people are aging in these in the developing world, but we don't have the specific supports in place to, to, to address them. Um, now, there is existing... Um, funding opportunities to work with developing countries and um, one of the things that's been a real learning curve for us is to make sure that um, actually it's not about necessarily the western developed world you know importing their models on um, from the developing world we've learned a lot from those so some of the favelas and the lower income communities in brazil had strong forms of social support and actually older adults were often assuming very meaningful roles in the community but the physical environment itself was w w what we would might call quite poor so often the you know even access emergency vehicles to these communities was very difficult so um i think we need more case study research in these developing countries i think we need to know how older adults are experiencing aging across these areas and i think we need to shift it more to how we create models in these in the developing world because as i mentioned earlier it's it is the developing world and the less developed world that, that are going through this rapidly aging process now and unless we have those models um and again these are in communities for example brazil that don't have well-developed formal support networks, for example, home care, um, that we benefit from in the UK. So how can age-friendly models work at creating these informal opportunities at a community level in developing countries that will enable these um, connections and will enable these to be made? So um, very different, you know, so in, in, certainly in Brazil, you know, focused on familial um, supports and therefore um, there's a big gap in sort of formal care supports, but that, that, that puts huge pressure on families as well in terms of providing um, providing care and support. So, um, yeah, I think we need more understanding around how people are aging in, in the developing world and, and models that need to be tailored to a developing con world context. Thank you, Dr. Woolrich. Um, I think that's all the questions we have time for. Uh, 
that being said, I'm aware that lots of other people have asked questions, so I will um, figure out the best format to circulate those questions. Um, and I also am aware that some people had asked for handouts and the recording of the webinar, which I will also um, circulate. So uh, thank you, Dr. Wolrich, for the fantastic presentation and to everyone for attending. Um, and I hope you all have an excellent day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jessica. Take care.